This show is brought to you by Databrill, the scalable Amazon PPC management for large Amazon sellers and brands. Visit sellersessions.com forward slash agency for more details. Hey guys, welcome back to Seller Sessions. Today I bring in Chad Rubin. Hey Chad, how you doing? Hello, thanks for having me. Excellent. Chad, do you want to give the audience a little bit of background on yourself? I have mentioned you, I've referenced you a few times on the show. Mm. I call you the unicorn piss in a rainbow because you're one of those sellers that do a massive chunk of yourselves off of Amazon. And yep. I've always been looking for more and more sellers that do that so that we can educate our audience. Because although I always say to people, if you've got a handful of products and, and you've only ever worked on the marketplace, do not go off Amazon until you get to a certain stage and how difficult it is to make the transition. But equally, I'm always looking for people to share their experiences so that when they are ready, they can come off Amazon and exploit that and make a success of it. So over to you. Awesome. Uh, so thanks for having me on again. Chad Rubin here. I run two businesses, actually. I run an e-commerce business and I run a software business called Stubana, which powers some of the largest Amazon sellers and brands off of Amazon. So I actually have a very interesting uh, viewpoint of the world. So I get to talk to all these awesome brands that also are making tons of money off of Amazon too, all day long. Cool. So uh, my background is <laughs> my parents owned a vacuum store when I was growing up. Uh, I never wanted to be in the vacuum business and I never wanted to be an entrepreneur because I watched them struggle. And uh, I went on to, I was a first generation college graduate. I went on to UMass Amherst in Massachusetts and studied finance because my parents were really deficient in finance. Uh, and then went on to Wall Street and I started covering internet stocks. And this is like when Al Gore invented the internet. Uh, and so I started covering internet stocks and I started seeing like massive growth happening online. So I said to my parents, you guys need to get on the internet. And they had no idea how to do it. So I actually helped them build the first, their first storefront, got them onto eBay. And then I said, okay, this is just a pissing match being a reseller. You're not yeah. creating any value. Let's actually go direct to consumer. Yeah. So I actually left that business, started my own business called Crucial, Crucial Vacuum, uh, which has morphed into Think Crucial. Uh, and so we disrupted the vacuum industry very, in a very short amount of time, uh, selling across all these different channels. And then I moved into all these other uh, accessories for the home, home appliance yeah. accessories. Uh, fast forward, I couldn't find a software to automate and run my business. I have one employee and it's an eight figure business. Uh, and I needed to find a technology stack that would actually automate and run my business. And we couldn't find it. So we started Stubana. So that's like the abridged version with a lot of ups and downs. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, what I'm interested in here, one, you've got a really interesting story, having a finance background, having an analytical brain that is obviously very helpful in terms of building your business. You also, I just want to point out here is in terms of scalability as well, the, the fact that you've got one full-time employee on an eight figure business is absolutely incredible. I want to dig in a little bit more on getting straight into the fact that you've managed to generate what percentage of your sales off of Amazon are you currently now? Right now, I think it's around 40 to 50%. Yeah. So that, and, and that's on an eight figure business. So that's, yes. that's, that's pretty good. And did you start this business before you went on to Amazon? So initially uh, we had our own website, which started on Magento. Uh, and then, or before that it was actually on Volusion, but we were on Magento. Uh, and then we were on eBay and this is like in the early days, like I'm a first generation Amazon seller. So like, this is when there was nobody on Amazon. There was no training courses. There was no podcasts. Yeah. It was a very different world back then. It was the wild west, mm -hmm. which by the way, now, if you look at other marketplaces, it is the wild, wild west now, like Walmart or Jet or any of these other companies. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that my product segment, it's important for the audience to know that my product segment is, is a commodity. Yeah. And actually it's very, very shoppable. Like when people buy toilet paper on Amazon, it's likely they'll buy a vacuum filter. So yeah. I know that if I actually had a product that was, uh, say sexy, sexier yeah. than just yeah. a commodity, I can even be doing much more business off of Amazon on those products. Yeah. I think it's it, the other thing because of the vacuum, you do spares and stuff. So it's a consumable products, a lot of the stuff mm -hmm. that you do, and it solves a problem. And I think one of the big failures of people coming from Amazon and off Amazon, which I, I always say is that if they've built their business on Amazon, they're focused about around their keyword research and product research about finding niches 
on Amazon, which might be good with Amazon bringing all the people to the marketplace. But when you take it off of Amazon, if that's not a, uh, a consumable product so that can be on a repeat buy, you've got to take in consideration the first generation of your advertising costs off of Amazon. You know, some people look at the long-term value of a customer. If you're selling spatulas, it's not like selling spare parts to mm -hmm. a commodity, you know, where people will come back on a regular basis. Or even things like food, you know, or uh, some sort of topicals that runs out after a month, they may come back and buy more. Then your advertising costs start to come down. So where did you, where do you kind of see um, the key points here that if you are going to sell off Amazon, what are the real must-haves for you? If you're going to sell off Amazon, I call that the anti-Amazon opportunity. Yeah. So okay. you need to find opportunity that where Amazon doesn't play in or where, so I, like when I think about this, I think about Casper mattress. Right. I think about Warby Parker. Uh, I think about Away Luggage. I think about Allbirds, the shoe company. Mm -hmm. I think about these companies that, have, that are disrupting categories and going super niche and creating an experience uh, and a, taking customers on a journey outside of Amazon's marketplace. Yeah. And so if I had to, like, let's just say I didn't have a software business like Stubana and I didn't have, I wasn't selling home appliance parts and accessories, that's where I would be spending most of my time. Yeah. Is like, what are categories that are ripe for disruption that can be, that are, that can create an experience off of Amazon? Like I have, we have one client, uh, like that was selling like, um, what, what is it? Like cigarette um, juice, you know, like for vaping. Yes. You can't yeah. sell that on Amazon, so it's a massive opportunity off of Amazon yeah. that you can play and you can, and they're they're just getting the entire market. Yeah, now it makes total sense. I, I used to when they first came out. I don't smoke anymore. I used to add that as well. And you again, yeah, you can't buy it off Amazon, and you literally them them little pods you get through them pretty quickly. So you're ordering two to three times a month, depends on the level of what you're vaping at as well. Um, so going back to like consumable so is your focus now because another thing that you do from my understanding you're always stacking new products aren't you okay and that's changed over time by the way so yeah. it used to be that there was no copycats on amazon uh there wasn't all these spying tools where people are just taking like looking up your bestseller rank and looking at your revenue and units and saying okay i can get this percentage of market share yeah uh, and so now we, we we really try to go into innovative products mm -hmm. uh innovative products where there are no me too's on the market and one of the ways that we do that is we do that by looking at what the searches are. So instead of going onto Amazon's marketplace and saying, hey, uh, this, this is an opportunity because this guy is doing this much revenue, we can take this kind of revenue from this person. We try to find that white space, that white ocean space where it's like, okay, nobody, there's a lot of demand for this. There's no supply. And let's actually solve that problem because we see a lot of people searching for that product. And yeah. then we try to back up what we're doing with like reviews and everything. But the, the thing that I always try to get come across is that if everyone's using the same tool to do product research, we're all going to send, end up with the same product at the end of the day. Yeah. Fishing in the same pool, isn't it? Exactly. What, um, what are you doing in terms of marketing that may be slightly different to say what other Amazon sellers do? Cause I know that on a technical level, in terms of a nine algorithm stuff, you're very smart on that area as well. Um, we're talking about on Amazon right now, right? Yeah, on Amazon, and then we can dis discuss some of your off Amazon stuff. You know, a lot of the a lot of the stuff is at least is now is like common sense, right? Yeah. Creating, curating your listings, making them built to sell, focusing on their conversion rate, uh, and optimizing for half for Amazon search, but also half so that the customer actually buys that product on your page. Uh, we're doing a lot of stuff on PPC that I think nobody's doing. We've mm -hmm. developed some sensitivity analysis. What does that uh, mean? Sorry, do you mind if I can ask you some questions? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. And I, I'm happy to, I can always like, present on this too. I, I do this often. Yeah. Uh, so the first one is you want to look at like what you're spending to what you're making and what is the correlation to what you spend to what you make, right? Yeah. So for every dollar my spend, am I actually getting a dollar for that spend? Yeah. A lot of people think that they spend money on Amazon, on PPC, and that goes into the whole... Um, uh, the whole cycle of, of Amazon of getting rain tire. Uh, and I have not yet seen proof that actually the more you spend on Amazon, the more people buy on a product on a PPC buy that is actually going to improve your rank. So the first thing we did was we did a correlation analysis and we were managing our, 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 our sponsored ads on Amazon. And just, I was like, okay, I just want to dominate my category. I'm going to spend as much as possible. And I'm not going to really care too much about a cost right now because that whole theme of like, okay, 
uh, if we outspend people, we get more visibility, we get more traffic, we get more conversions, and then we're going to rank higher. Yeah. Uh, so first thing we did was a sensitivity analysis. I hired a, a banker to understand the sensitivity or the, uh, the correlation between what we spend to what we make. And we had a very low R coefficient mm -hmm. uh, going back into, uh, into my college days. Very low R coefficient, which means there's, there's actually not a connection between what you spend to what, you, what you're making for that dollar that you're, that you're making on Amazon. Yeah. And so we started to tighten that, that R coefficient, and getting that R coefficient as close to one as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so we started working on that, and we started lowering our A costs dramatically, like dramatically, dramatically, because like we're not in business to spend money to just get a higher BSR. Yeah. Our job at my company is to spend money that's going to actually increase our bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, there was a key. paradigm shift. It was, it's cheap for sure, but it was a paradigm shift for us at our company because I was like, I was kind of buying into this whole, like, we need to do whatever it takes to like increase our page rank. And at the end of the day, that actually helps who? That helps Amazon. Yeah. So we've like adjusted that whole process. And then we started understanding with the sensitivity analysis, all things being equal. If your operating structure remains the same mm -hmm. and you adjust your ACOS, Right, and you tweet that ACOS, and so we did this this analysis where okay, if all things remain constant, and let's just say our revenue grew only five percent, or ten percent, or fifteen percent, adjusting the ACOS, what does that affect to our bottom line? So what is the absolute sweet spot that's going to make us the absolute most most amount of money with the products that we have, with the spend that we have? Yeah, makes sense. And I think that's different than what a lot of other people are doing. A lot of people are just saying, hey, this is our ACOS or I just want to dominate on Amazon. I want to increase my BSR and I'm not going to care about profit. Yeah. And I think that's a mistake and we made that mistake. Yeah. No, it is, it's easy to fall into that trap. I don't, I don't like the metric for our agency. I don't like the metric ACOS in isolation because, you know, we've had people where they will want to reduce their ACOS. I'll give an example. We had someone who, which would sound fair on the surface, right? They wanted to take their ACOS from 40% down to 30%. But in okay. order to achieve that, we'd have lost 45, 50% of their sales. We like to look at profitability. Yeah. The other thing that you were just mentioning about ACOS, I think is important that we did just internally, yeah. is that instead of having a waxing ACOS for our entire business, like we need for our entire business to be at 20% ACOS or 30% ACOS. Yeah. We actually tiered our SKU. So we have a tier one SKU, a tier two SKU, and a tier three SKU. Yeah. And we assign an ACOS to the three different tiers because we have so many SKUs. We have a thousand private label products yeah. uh, with uh, kits and bundles that gets you to 3,000 listings. Yeah. So we actually calculated what is the proper ACOS tier for each of those SKUs. Yeah. And so not all ACOSs are equal. So like if That's we're right. making more money on a SKU and we're making, and we have 60% margins on a SKU, let's double down on the SKU and let's even like make more money. Let's do it all day. Yeah. But a SKU that's only making us 8% or 10%, we need to have a lower ACOS and that has dramatically impacted our bottom line. Yeah. Makes total sense. So in terms of, um, if we slip off, off of Amazon now, what kind of things are you doing in terms of marketing? Are you running uh, Google shopping ads? Uh, you've got a, a, an SEO team working on it in terms of like a third party team? Yeah, so uh, we're doing a lot. So again, I'm in the commodity space, so we don't do a lot of social media. Yeah. Okay, so like nobody, if you go on Facebook, you don't want to see a dirty vacuum filter or get like an ad for a vacuum filter. Yeah. But you'd love to get a, an ad for, you know, depending on what your passion is, could be nootropics, could be whatever, shoes. Yeah. So we, first of all, we're on every single channel off Amazon. So I'm in a, about 18 channels, mm -hmm. roughly 18 to 20. Uh, so think about it. Uh, Jet, Walmart, eBay, Shopify, Home Depot, uh, Groupon, Overstock, uh, all the international channels. And all these little independent channels as well, the smaller channels. So we're everywhere. We're, I look at selling online, especially marketplace selling, uh, as playing Monopoly. Yeah. And in order to win in Monopoly, you need to be on every piece of the board to win, right? You need to have Park Ave. You need to have the utilities. That's a great game. Yeah. So, uh, so that's one of our strategies is to be on all these marketplaces because they also do all the Google PLAs as well, right? Mm -hmm. So when you Google something, I'm just taking up more real estate space especially product listing ads, because eBay will advertise for us or Walmart will, adver will advertise for us or Jet will advertise for us. Yeah. Uh, in terms of our own website, we're also doing PLAs and I'm doing a ton of SEO work. I do a ton of SEO work for, for both my businesses. Yeah. And so what the SEO work for me is, is we're working on a lot of, for Subana, it's a lot of content and a lot of backlinks. And the same thing applies 
for when you have a site off Amazon, right? It's content and backlinks. Yeah. So the, the old tradition of what's been built off the back of the internet is that it's links and it's content, rich content. So do you, you find in the, obviously Skibana is probably a lot easier to come up with content for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I've got a, a construction business as well. Completely unsexy. It's not like, I can treat that in the same way as a sexy product where you've got loads of ideas of generating content. Like I used to work in the music industry. That's easy to generate content for, for SEO. Yeah. There's, there's a story behind it. There's news that comes out. What do you do in terms of vacuum parts as it's not a non sexy business in terms of SEO? How do you manage to come up with engaging content for that? So by the way, a software SEO versus local SEO, which is your construction business yeah. versus e-commerce SEO for vacuums, yeah. very, very, very different. Okay. So yeah. With local SEO for you, you'd care about how do I get, if someone types in construction and the area you're, you're in, yeah. uh, how do I get into the three stack uh, for local page uh, on the algorithm of Google or, yeah. and Yelp as well? That's where I would focus my time. For software, it's completely different. For e-commerce, first of all, my my niche is super, super hard because nobody really cares, Yeah. right? Media agencies don't care. PR companies, like nobody cares. So essentially, we need to actually come up with either really, really good content or find small DIY blogs that are adjacent to what we're doing that will give us a backlink. Yeah. Uh, and backlink, when I say backlink, we either have to do, you know, some sort of either guest boat post on their site. Uh, we'll do a, a swap, perhaps. Uh, we'll have to maybe give them their community a discount uh, to, to our products. Uh, and I just migrated from Magento to Shopify and I'm like rebuilding again. Like I had to, I had to do a lot of um, redirects in my site. It was, so I think, you know, before we got onto this call, you were like, Chad, it, there's so much more that has to happen off Amazon to win. Yeah. And honestly, the same thing is, is that on Amazon, there's so much that has to happen to win too. Like both of these are very, very different parts of your brain yeah. and require a very different skill set. And luckily I like, I just like, I like doing both. Yeah. Well, you're doing an incredible amount of stuff considering you're managing an eight figure, two businesses. You've got one full-time member of staff and you're working on and off Amazon. I find that incredible. I think I work seven days a week, but I, and you were talking off call, if you don't mind me saying doing CrossFit and everything else. I just don't know how you slot it all in. So how do you manage something so big? Like, are you hands on with this SEO stuff yourself or are you using, because you've got like only a full-time member of staff, you do use a lot of third party vendors and stuff and manage those, do you? I do a ton. So we, so at, at my e-commerce business, I have one point person. She's the key, the quarterback. Yeah. And she, her, her job was to, I was to, I was like, look, delegate and elevate. At one point we had 30 people in my e-commerce business. I had a yeah. warehouse, things were not good at the warehouse. So I outsourced the warehouse. And then we had a team of office people doing marketing and you're pulling from a very small segment, like in New Jersey, where we were located, I would have to find someone with that right, with the right skill set to come in. And it's, and it was, it's a small town. So going remote allowed us to find people with a skill set and working on things that, that were our weakness, right? Getting the weakness off of our plate. Mm. And so finding somebody to do our PPC the right way, uh, finding somebody to do SEO and building that team is so important. And we use a project management tool called Basecamp to manage our entire team structure. Uh, and I put a lot of time into that. And we, we build our culture through Basecamp. Uh, our remote culture through Basecamp. Like there's a, there's a theme in our Basecamp that we have and we try to make it fun and we try to make it, you know, we try to have like introductions to, to new, new members in the team. So there's a lot of, so that's, that's the e-commerce side. And I can talk about how I find these people. Uh, yeah. And then there's the Scubana side, which is everybody is in New York. Everybody is hands-on. All of our developers are in New York. It's a very, very different business. We're about 28 people now in yeah. New York. And um, I have to be very efficient with my time to to be able to run two businesses it's very very difficult yeah so i mean what, how do you split your your day up to run these businesses and do you are you at it seven days a week or you take some time out for yourself or uh me and my wife we work hard we play hard so like we go all in because she's also an entrepreneur she has a yoga studio yeah so uh we work incredibly hard i don't i mean it's it's not about work-life balance for us it's about work-life integration how do yeah. we integrate work into our life even when we just came back from uh, montauk East New York and 
uh, it's as far as you can go onto the beach of New York. And we, we have to take calls. We have to deal with fires, but we would you know, go to restaurants and hang out. So I think there's this, there's a balance. There's a, I don't, I don't want to say it's a balance, right? We just integrate it into our life. Yeah. Even when we go on vacation, it's just a part of what we need to do. Yeah, no, I'd like to clear, like when I'm away on holiday, I like to clear in the morning and try and clear as many things across the three businesses so that I know that I can go off and enjoy the rest of my day. If I've got to deal with clients or I've got a fire to put out, I take them calls whether I'm on the beach or not. I prefer that than coming back to it all a week, two weeks later because it allows you to do it. And that's why, you know, some people think why I must be mad working at weekends, but I like to, my mornings is where I get everything done. I'm an early starter. You get so much out of the way and then your day becomes easier. And I think what's really important, you've got to love what you do. Cause if you hate doing it, then you can do what we do. I mean, you're in a different league here, but um, yeah. Now we're great. same, we're same league. Yeah. We're both entrepreneurs and we're both riding the, this journey, right? There's a lot of ups and there's a lot of downs. Yeah. Uh, so, I would say that I structure my Mondays as my listening day, my, my, yeah. my stand up meeting day. Yeah. So Monday is pretty much dedicated to having our stand up meetings with either my, my VAs, with the Stubano team, with the, the executives at, uh, at Stubano, with my executives uh, at Crucial. And we have, you know, we're experimenting different with different uh, meeting types, but we'll have meetings where we just go into, okay, here's, here's the problems we need to solve. This is what's on our plate. This is what we've accomplished. And we try to keep them super tight. Yeah. So do you find that, um, cause, I mean, someone with, with multiple businesses, like do you ever find you get decision fatigue? So you work best maybe in the morning and then you kind of structure your days around the decision making and when you, op you know, when you're at your optimal. Well, I think that this is how I do it is I structure my day with the cycles of the sun and the moon. Right. So in the morning, it's all the things that require a lot of mental capacity. Like that's when I have the most energy in my brain. And that's when you don't want to get any email. You don't want to even do any emailing at that time because it's, 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 um, it's not a good use of your energy at that moment. Yeah. So I try to focus all my attention on the things that require most of my energy in the morning. Then I'll have lunch and I get a, a little, maybe I'll, I'll take a espresso or coffee. Uh, and then in the, in the late afternoon, when things start dying down, that's when I go through my email flow. Yeah. Luckily, I have VAs working on my email box throughout the entire day, drafting and, and working. We have a flag and tag system on emails so that I really don't even need to check my emails anymore. But I have to go in there once in a while to actually review and authorize specific emails that require my attention. Yeah, makes total sense. So would you say that your early days on, the, on Wall Street, etc., is been a great foundation to what you're doing now because it's almost like it's almost money ball in, in a way like the juggling that you're doing across all the businesses you're you're removing all the inefficiencies out i think for wall street it, it was two things one is it taught me how to work very very long hours without moving hmm. so we, i would work at 7 a.m till 2 a.m every day for three three and a half years uh and i think that was a teaching moment for me uh, and the second piece was really the analytics, right? Mm -hmm. Having that, the, the mindset to analyze these businesses and see, and I, I, it gave me a lot of insight in, ter in terms of running my own businesses and my P&L. Yeah, makes total sense. Cool. Is there anything you would like to add before we go? Um, so uh, did we close the loop on just like selling off Amazon? Because I know that you are a firm believer before we got on this call, you're like, hey, I think that you should be on Amazon. And I'm just curious, did we close the loop on that? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I know that we've moved around the subjects a bit because there's quite a lot of areas that you're doing and I wanted to make sure this is covered. But I think the key thing here is maybe what we could move into before we go. Let's talk a bit about the marketplaces, the other marketplaces. Um, yeah. So the first thing is, why should you go on to other, why should you go off Amazon? I think that's the first question. Yeah. Why should someone get off of Amazon? So Amazon is a gateway drug. It's super easy to get started and super hard to ever leave, yeah. right? So the idea is, at least from my Wall Street days, I think to myself, okay, Chad, would you ever invest in a stock that has one customer? Mm -hmm. That's a massive amount of risk. So how do you diversify that risk? Well, you create a basket of stocks that have, and that'll diversify your risk level. Yeah. And the same thing for Amazon. I've been suspended on Amazon five times. Wow. And it hurts. So the question is, is how do you actually diversify? Okay, marketplaces and shopping carts. So that's where I started 
diversifying after tasting the bottom of the barrel of being suspended. So then the next question is, how do you manage it? First of all, you need to have a system in place. Even if you don't sell multiple channels, you need to have a system in place to run and automate your business. And the system that you pick determines really the level, the, the, what you're going to achieve with your business. In other words, if you pick a software that's just a one, um, it's like a one trick pony that only supports Amazon, then the chances of ever getting off Amazon are very slim, which is why we built Stubana. It's a multi-channel operation system. Hmm. So you need to figure out what system you're gonna invest in that's gonna make your, your, your business plug and play. Yeah. So like when you go to McDonald's in the UK and you go to the McDonald's in Newark, New Jersey, it's likely that that burger will be the same. Yeah. The quality of the burger, the standard of the burger, how much ketchup, all of it is all systemized. So I think sellers should really think about the foundational elements of their business and how they can systemize it. Yeah. Then once you start getting other channels, you want to automate that process. You need one, one click integrations to all these different sales channels as you expand, which of course, that's what Stubana does. Yeah. Now we automate a lot of productivity things, which allows me to have one employee uh, but in terms of like looking at marketplaces, you should do your research and understand where does your where do people where do your customers that buy your product where do they spend their time? For me, because I sell a commodity item, they spend their time on Walmart, they spend their time on eBay, they spend their time on Google, and they spend their time on Amazon, Groupon, Overstock. Those are all ancillary. Home Depot is another great one for us. So like if you were selling uh, a really cool smart luggage. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great place for you to target travelers and travel people that are hacking their way of travel on Facebook and on Instagram. Uh, or even like you can even focus on people that are on Twitter that are complaining about their luggage during travel. Like there's a lot of different angles you can have to capture those eyeballs and then eventually capture the wallet share of those clients. Makes total sense. I think it goes, to, I, I still think as well, uh, a part of, apart from what you achieved is brilliant. I think, that you're doing the commodity products does make it, you know, if you pick the right one, it makes a difference. My concern for the guys that sell on Amazon, if you say you're selling spatulas in home and kitchen, I think that when you come off Amazon, there's a bit more of a limitation there. Like you said earlier, you've got to find those niches that are not so popularized on Amazon and then dominate, dominate them off of Amazon. And I think if you can have a product that you can sell on a reoccurring basis to the same customers, that also gives you a good foundation mm -hmm. to grow off Amazon as well. So what totally. is, yeah. oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, yeah, a lot of sellers don't think about their LTV, the lifetime value of their clients. Yeah. So when they think about their spend, even when it's just on Amazon, they don't ever think about, okay, how am I gonna dip back into this person's wallet again to yeah. get them to do a two, a two buy or a three buy or a four buy? Yeah. Because I think the, the point where people come off Amazon is they maybe have like two or three products then come off Amazon. So even when they do come off Amazon and they are one-off products that people buy maybe once every year, every couple of years, it's very hard to market to the two other products that they're interested to. So I'll give you an analogy. I used to be a head of digital of a ticketing company in the UK. Email was a big thing for us. PPC, not so much because we're against the... The, the primary and the secondary market will just bury you. So we went into the niche market. So we done like, um, like the, 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 like the smaller kind of festivals and beer festivals mm. and you know, that, so you can win rather than trying to do Drake and Rihanna tickets because you'll lose there against the, the primaries and the secondary. But the point I was bringing there is because we had such an array of tickets across the board, we were able to retarget to these customers through email because we had such an array of products. So if you've got a very small sh store and you can't sell back to the customer in terms of a reoccurring product to sell, you are also limited to what you can do until you buy more products to market to them same people. And the same again with like, if you've got an email list that you've built of the products that you have sold, if there's a big gap between bringing on a new product to sell and promote off of Amazon, that list might, might have you know, kind of died down. So the conversion's going to be quite low. So you have to get the balance right, don't you, when you make that move off? Yeah, totally. I think the, the, my mantra is really of like, how do you win if you're doing what everyone else is doing? If, yeah. if you listen to every podcast or the big podcasts in the space and they're telling you to do things a certain way or use their specific tools, if everyone's using those same tools and you're never going to get an edge up, there's no competitive advantage. Yeah. I was listening to this one um, podcasts and they were saying, you know, should you sell off Amazon? No, right? 
they were, they were literally telling their entire audience of thousands of people, you should not sell off Amazon, you should just be on Amazon. Yeah. And I think that's, not only do I think that's immature, but in my head, I was thinking to myself, wait a minute. So you guys started selling on Amazon and did you diversify? Okay, maybe you didn't have the, the moxie to go off Amazon, I get it. But what did you do? You actually developed a podcast that diversified your income. You're probably making more, right? Teaching people how to dig for, for gold than you are actually doing the, actually yeah. digging with shovels yourself right now. Yeah. So they actually are ironically diversifying off of Amazon in their own way. Yeah. So whether you choose to go off Amazon or whether you choose to actually take your money and put it in real estate or put it in something else, like you need to think about, you need to think about long-term wealth versus just short-term income. Yeah, no, totally. And I think a big thing you look, should look at as well is I'm a big fan of, and you won't win every time, is that when you see people over this side, do the opposite, go in the very, you know, go to the very dark corners that no one touches. I think it's the same when we started with the, the podcast, Richard and I, is that our goal was no nonsense podcast with we basically our audience are other Amazon sellers who have got busy days. You've got a busy day. So mm -hmm. we want to focus on no nonsense, just get straight to the point. Not everything yeah. I'm going to say is right. And that will change over a period of time. And I love it to bring people on to have a little debate with, you know, uh, because like mm -hmm. I said to you, it's like you've proven to me that you sell well off of Amazon. So even though I say to people, you've got to be in the right position to sell off Amazon, I love to bring people on like yourself who's proven that you can sell off Amazon, but yeah. you, are, you are rare. For sure. But I also think, Danny, I think that you surround yourself in this circle of Amazon yeah. and you have to, have to understand that there's so much life outside of Amazon. Of course, yeah. And like, if I named you a couple of brands that are just absolutely killing, you'd be like, I've never even heard of that brand, but I promise you they're doing incredible. Yeah. Right. A few, a few of them, Mac Weldon, Away Luggage, Quip Toothbrushes, Allbirds, Thinks, yeah. uh, Tough and Needle, Outdoor Voices, Gymshark, Pura Vida, all these people, most, a lot of them aren't even on Amazon. Yeah. And they're huge and they're selling thousands and thousands of units. So it's, it's easy. Okay, you go to Alibaba, you source a product, you 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 find that the the um the revenue of that product of of competitors, and you try to just throw it up on Amazon, work towards getting a better bestseller rank and getting more traffic and getting conversions. But there's a whole nother skill set off of Amazon that's just so yeah. fruitful and actually is so inspiring to see. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And, and my thing is is that you must be ready to make the leap. I always go back to the same thing. If you've never done e-commerce before, you don't understand PPC, conversion optimization, SEO, cart abandonment, all of those things, and then you go and build a store, don't expect to be successful straight away. You've got to learn about each of those sure. attributes mm -hmm. and take the losses and then build them up from there. But, but Danny, isn't it the same thing on Amazon that you have to learn about all the tools that are Amazon, your keyword research, harvesting those keywords, yes. your PPC and your ACOS and your giveaways and your discounts and your enhanced brand content. Agreed. I mean, we're talking about the same thing. It's just, where do you want to put your time and focus? Exactly. I, I agree with you. Like, as the thing is, I'm not against selling off of Amazon. What I am against is for people to not understand what's involved and just assume, you know, they've never sold on their own website. All they understand is Amazon. They've not, never done commerce. Then they build a Shopify site because they've watched some sort of webinar that says you're going to make millions or whatever. They build the site and then it's like, well, there's no traffic. Why is there no traffic? Well, you haven't set up your process in terms of information architecture on the site. What's that? You haven't done SEO. What's SEO? Do, do you see where I'm coming from? So I think people, if you're going to sell off Amazon, which you should to find a way to diversify, just be ready for it and know sure. what you're doing and have the budget what, what requires because you're going to need money to get start build the traffic and set your expectations. Because the thing is, if you look at the conversion rates off of Amazon, let's just say listings convert, say, 12, 15, 16, 70% on average on Amazon, depends on the category. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're on, on un, unlike yourself, because you know about this, but if you're selling off of Amazon, 1% conversion rate is really good. But then mm -hmm. you've got to take into consideration, that's fine. So this is say you only want to drive organic traffic. You've got to get 100 vid visits a day to your site to get one conversion. And that takes time. And that's what you've sure. got to go into. And that's my point on it is that you alluded to this earlier on, is that you think long term, you think big picture. And I think if anyone is selling off of Amazon and started on Amazon, 
go into it with making sure you've got the budget and be careful as well to not uh, take your eye off the ball on what's going on at Amazon. Because I've got friends like in my mastermind group who's done 50 to 100 grand off of Amazon. Like you, they got suspended. They're in the supplement space. They went and got an ag outside agency and they thought, right, I've got to build this off Amazon. And mm -hmm. they, blew, they blew through a load of cash. Not only did they do that, which they weren't bothered about because it was a risk and they took that risk. The biggest sin that they did do is they, they were so invested in the offsite thing, they let their Amazon business to go and then they had to build it up. So that's where it comes down to you've got to manage everything correctly, you know, and yeah. take care of your bread and, and butter. And the same thing with Amazon though, right? Amazon yeah. right now is only the strong will survive. That's the environment that we're in on Amazon. Yeah. There are... 50 new Chinese sellers coming on on a daily basis onto Amazon's platform. Yeah. It's absolutely incre crazy how many people are actually coming on. Yeah. So <laughs> you have to really ask yourself, especially when you come out with a product, does my product even solve a problem? Is even, wh why am I coming out with a garlic press or a silicon baking mat or a spatula? Yeah. And I think the money to be made either on Amazon or off Amazon right now is innovative, focusing on an innovative product that actually has a specific angle mm. that solves a problem. Makes total sense. Cool. Is there anything uh, you want to add before we go? Um, hmm, I think we, I think we covered, I think we covered a lot. I, mean, <laughs> I think we definitely covered a lot. I would say, look, at the end of the day, let's, 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 let's end with this. Uh, everything that I've learned was not taught in school. Yeah. Right? I'm sure the same with you. Yeah. This is taught in the school of life and just hitting the ground running and making mistakes. Yeah. So like, we're all going to make mistakes. And I think that's just a part of being an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I think you just have to have some, uh, some hustle and uh, you have to have some good instincts. Uh, you need to have some patience. And I think that you have to be okay with, if you're not, you're not growing unless you're failing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people are scared of failure. Whereas me, I embrace it. I make mistakes every single day of the week, but mm -hmm. I always make sure that, you know, as much as how fast I run with the ball and I make mistakes, as long as I've got a path correction in place, that's fine. Um, but I don't beat myself up over making mistakes. And I think some people do, and that's what can slow down your progress, except that you're never going to get everything right and just ride the waves. And the same, by the way, for Amazon, right? You're yeah. going to fail on Amazon. Not every product is going to win. Yeah. Babe Ruth only had an 8% home run record. So when you're launching product, don't expect to have a home run record of 40, 50%. And I know these podcasts, they think that you're going to just launch a product and you make all this money and that's it. But that's, it's not the truth, right? Yeah, not at all. We've, done, we've actually done podcasts on failure. I've had six failed products in the last 18 months. Not recently, but I had a, a barren run last year. But I learned so much from those failures. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So, and yeah. that's the thing, as I said, we've done probably six sh shows on failed products because we wanted the people to learn about the failures so that they go, all yeah. oh, right, okay, if I go into the category, I know I need that bit of paperwork, I need to do that, I'll leave that alone. And that's where people can really learn. I think you can learn more from failure and reading into that than you can through success, you know, because success yeah. is important because you have to weigh off the two. But in terms of learning, I think you can learn so much from people's failures and your own. Yeah, completely agree. Cool. So, Chad, if anyone wants to reach us, your banner, you directly, email address, uh, what's yeah. the best way to reach Yeah, so Stubana, uh, S-K-U-B-A-N-A dot com, chat at Stubana. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. I'm not really active on Twitter. On Facebook, uh, I wrote a book, Cheaper, Easier, Direct, which is really my blueprint of how I created products on Amazon. And then we have an awesome event coming up in October in New York called Accelerate. Cool. And so you can a, check it out, stubana.com slash Accelerate. Sounds good. Great. Thank you for joining us today, guys. Thank you for joining us. If this is your first time, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. I'll be back and I'll see you in a few days time. Take care.